Praise the Lord. Good morning. Welcome to Faith and Healing class. Uh, I'm Betty Storino, pastor here at Abundant Grace Church in Toms River, New Jersey. And uh, this is a class that the Lord has uh, impressed upon our hearts uh, over three years ago now. Probably, yeah, something around that. And uh, to begin teaching, and uh, we're teaching God's Word. And uh, we're not teaching our own thoughts or ideas about God's Word. We are reiterating what His Word says. In fact, the Bible is our textbook. And so uh, we feed our spirits on God's anointed Word, and our faith uh, grows uh, exponentially from it. And um, uh, faith comes to us by hearing, and not just hearing anything, but hearing from God. And that's why we stress the importance of, uh, of meditating in God's Word, spending time with Him, and uh, hungering and thirsting for righteousness. And God is certainly not trying to keep things a secret from us. He's kept them hidden for us, uh, but He expects us to get in here and dig some things out. So that's the premise of this class. And um, if you're tuning in for the first time, we say welcome. Uh, there's not a set curriculum, uh, if you would, you know, to say where you feel like, oh, if I didn't start three months ago, where am I going to, um, each class is, uh, we're endeavoring to be led by the spirit. And so we teach on the subject as the spirit of God gives us utterance. Uh, but you can go back, um, all of our sessions, including these Tuesday through Friday, uh, faith and healing classes, our Wednesday evening services at 7 p.m. and our Sunday morning services at 10 a.m. are all uh, recorded. You can obviously view them live, but they are recorded and they can be found on our YouTube channel, which if you go to our website, AbundantGraceChurch.com, uh, there's a YouTube link on our homepage. Click on that. It'll direct you to our YouTube channel and you can go back and view. It's free. It's for your benefit. So uh, if it's free, there's no excuse, right? <laughs> so praise God. It'll be good for you. Faith comes again by hearing and hearing the word of God. There's so many things that we can hear that will weaken our faith, that will bring fear instead of faith. But it's amazing. God's word is medicine. It's medicine. And uh, how many know that you can take medicine in the midst of chaos and begin to improve. And uh, God's word is the same way. No matter what's happening around us, uh, our, our present condition, you know, we're going to pray here uh, the Ephesian prayers. And I always note out that um, and point out that, that Paul uh, was in prison while he was in, getting inspired from the Holy Ghost, these prayers that he was praying. And uh, unless you knew the history, you wouldn't think that that's where he was because Paul was not um, moved by his present condition. And uh, he was putting God's word to work in his life right where he was, just like we can and we should, because there's a benefit. There's a benefit to acting on the word of God and agreeing with God's word, regardless of what our mind's telling us, regardless of what our, our, our condition may be or our situation may be, whether it's financial, whether it's healing, whether it's uh, a relationship, a marriage, your children, a job, all of those things, um, God has us covered in his word if we'll get into it and look at it and begin to agree with God and not side with our our, our, our present condition. And so, uh, so faith does come by hearing. And, uh, so we're taking God's medicine this morning and his word is medicine. And just like you expect medicine that you take, that a doctor prescribes, you expect it to work. You don't understand how it does. You don't even care how it does. You just know that it, 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 it works and you expect it to apply that same exact principle to his word, because his word is a better medicine than any other kind of medicine. And it works whether we understand how it's working, whether we see it working, or whether anything else, it's working on our behalf. And so this is the fight of faith. This is the casting our cares on him, uh, for he cares for us, and then allowing the peace of God to rule and reign in our lives. Amen? So uh, that's really the premise of this class, and uh, the, God has been so good to us. Uh, all the teaching, whether it's me, uh, Reverend Tom, Pastor Frank, or my mom, Miss Carol, or whoever else is teaching, it's anointed word. And, uh, and we are, uh, you know, I use the term stickler. Uh, if it's not God's word, we have no interest in it. It 
has to be the word of God. I'm not interested in, um, and our staff is the same way. They know that we're not inter- interested in opinions or, or, well, this is what I think. Because what we think means nothing. It's what God's word says and declares, and then it bears witness with our own spirit. And, uh, and that's truth, and that truth makes us free. So we are so thankful. God has been so good and faithful in honoring his word. So let's, uh, let's go before him now and uh, join our faith together. Let's release our faith. And I'll put it, I, I like to break it down into even simpler terms. Uh, when we say let's release our faith, that might sound ambiguous. And well, what do we mean? Well, let's put our trust in God. That we all understand. We're going to put our trust in him that he's going to speak through me as I open my mouth. I've done my part, but I'm only a messenger of his, of his message. So we're going to trust him together, all of us, uh, in faith, expecting to have the utterance, revelation, knowledge, and impartations of truth today that will make us free. One word from God, uh, something that impressed upon your spirit, can change your entire destiny, can change your life forever. Uh, If it's healing, it could change you from thinking that you're going to die to knowing you're going to live, from taking you from from poverty to provision. Amen? Uh, The power is in his word. So let's agree on that together and thank the Lord for it today. Father, we come to you now. Lord, your word is the most important thing in our lives. You are the most important thing, and your word is Jesus. It is your will given to us. It is your intent, your purpose, your heart towards your children. And Father, we we honor it. We esteem it. We're forever and eternally grateful for it. It is living and it is powerful. It is our medicine. And so as we open it and touch it this morning, all of us who are here in the building, those who are watching us, wherever they may be, we are putting our trust in you that you are going to speak through my mouth the words that you want spoken. You know what we need to hear today. So we're trusting you for the utterance. We're asking you for revelation knowledge, Father, a parting of the veil, a removal of the curtain, so we could see clearly what has been there all along. We thank you for today that you're answering questions. You're confirming things in our heart. You're prompting us and correcting us in areas. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit who is our counselor. He's our teacher. He's our guide. We acknowledge you today. We thank you for your work in our lives and ask that you teach us, reveal truth to us, help us, and counsel us through our lives. And Father, most importantly, we say you be glorified in this. Be magnified. You be lifted up. You be seen. And you be heard. And may all people be drawn to you and point it into a relationship with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Glory to God. Well, we're ready to go. Uh, as, uh, as I stated before, um, we've been praying our Ephesian prayers, Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 3, and then Colossians 1 in our classes, and uh, the Lord has been giving us tremendous, tremendous revelation that I believe otherwise we would not have or know. And uh, it's a condition of our heart, it's a matter of humility and obedience and submission, and, and it shows that we esteem it and honor it, so he honors us. It says that in Samuel, that those who honor me, I will honor. And so we, that's why we do this. It's not a ritualistic, it's not a religious thing. It's, uh, it's honoring his word. And so we're going to do it again today, and uh, we're going to believe God for, for more revelation. As we, as we pray these prayers together now, this is the GW, God's Word, translation. Um, I have rewritten it in the first person as if we were praying it. So you can follow along with me, whatever translation that you have. But uh, we're going to start in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 17, and we're going to pray these together in faith. Amen? So Paul starts off here. He says, I pray to you, the glorious Father, the God of my Lord Jesus Christ, that you would give me a spirit of wisdom and revelation as I come to know you better. You know, there's that word revelation, and sometimes that sounds like, ooh, revelation, and revelation is just reveal, something that's being revealed, um, not new, but fresh. Uh, Fresh revelation, uh, meaning it was there all the time, we just didn't see it, but 
the curtain has parted and now we can see it. And this is what Paul's praying. Give me a spirit of wisdom and revelation as I come to know you better. Uh, then I will have deeper insight. And you know, these things, uh, I noticed the, 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 the wording here that you'd give me a spirit of wisdom, not a feeling of wisdom, not a feeling of revelation. Because what happens if you feel one day that you have revelation and the next day you don't feel like you have so much revelation? What do we do? No, it is a spirit of uh, wisdom and revelation, not based on our feelings. And that's important for us to note because um, that means that's something that we have all the time. We are a spirit and we communicate with God in the spirit because he is a spirit. So it's a spirit of wisdom and revelation, not a feeling of wisdom and revelation. It's a spirit that I, as I come to know you better, then I will have deeper insight. I will know the confidence that you want me to have and the glorious wealth that your people will inherit. Deeper insight, meaning um, deeper insight comes from a spirit of wisdom and revelation that only comes from meditating on God's word. Um, it doesn't come from uh, self-help books. Those are, those are good. Those can supplement things. It doesn't come from wishful thinking and hoping. It comes from a spirit of wisdom and revelation that is found only, this, would, this is what makes this book, and I don't even like to call it a book, but the Bible, God's Word, completely different from any other manual that's ever been written or book that's been written. This is a living word. It's full of life. It's full of power. It's full of wisdom and revelation and insight that comes as a result of, of, of meditating in it, being in it, partaking of it, daily bread. This is our daily bread. Amen? He said, so I will know the confidence that you want me to have and the glorious wealth that your people Will inherit. Now, I know uh, we're praying these, but the Lord has given us um, some insight and some revelation as we're going through it, which is why I kind of pause as we're going through it. And we've prayed these prayers countless times. And, uh, and every time, the Spirit of God, because our faith is hooked to it, shows us something a little different that maybe we haven't touched on before. Uh, he wants us to have confidence. And the only way we're going to know the confidence that he wants us to have is by meditating in his word. This is what Paul is saying here. And, uh, and again, this doesn't sound like a prayer of desperation. God, get me out of prison. This isn't fair. Uh, this is a prayer of consecration to God. And, uh, and, and so the confidence, God wants us to be confident that you want me to have the glorious wealth that your people will inherit. I will also know the unlimited greatness of your power. His power is great and it's unlimited. Now, some people, I can hear it, say, well, why isn't he doing anything? Because it's not what he's able to do. It's what we, by faith, because we're meditating in his word and we have deeper insight, what are we able to trust him to do? What are we able to trust he's already done for us and what can we receive? Is everybody, that, that's important to know. Because uh, the unlimited greatness of your power, as it works with might and strength, for me, a believer. All things are possible for believers. Believers. Uh, that's you and I. You worked with that same power in Christ when you brought him back to life and gave him the honored position, the one next to you, the Father, on the heavenly throne. Jesus is far above all rulers authorities, powers, lords, governments, because that's what we know, and all other names that can be named, not only in this present world, but also in the world to come. You have put everything under the control of him regarding the church, and I specify that because people blame God for the destruction that's happening in the world today, and for people killing one another, and for little children dying, and for old people dying and for the diseases that we know. God is not in control of what goes on in, in this world that we live in. That is Satan, who is the God of this world. And scriptures tell us plainly that. 
that he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it, not just life, but that you might have good, abundant life. So everything is under the control of him regarding the church, us, okay, who have been rescued from the powers of darkness. And then you made Jesus the head of the church, made him the head of everything for the good of the church, the benefit of the church. The church is his body and completes him as he fills everything in every way. Glory to God. It is a great, great benefit, Jesus being the head of the church. Um, because we have access to the name of Jesus, and the scriptures tell us that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord, and, and that the, the demonic forces flee at the mention of his name. So glory to God. You and I, as believers, have access to his name. Thank you, Lord. And then the, the next one we're praying is found in Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 16. Thank you, Lord. See, we're always getting something different from these prayers every time. Hallelujah. Ephesians 3, beginning in verse 16. Paul continues here. And in case you're wondering, he's still in a dungeon. Uh, he says, I'm asking you, God to give me a gift from the wealth of your glory. I pray that you would give me your inner strength and power through your spirit, that Christ will live in me through faith, through faith, through trusting. And that's how Christ lives in us. I also pray that love may be the ground into which I sink my roots and on which I have my foundation. This way, with all of God's people, I will be able to understand how wide, long, high, and deep your love is. He goes on to say, I will know Christ's love. Not, I hope I do, I wish I could know. He says, I will know Christ's love, which goes far beyond any knowledge. I am praying this so that I may be completely filled with you, Father God. Glory belongs to you whose power is at work in me. By your power, you can do infinitely more than I can ask or imagine. Glory belongs to you in the church and in Christ Jesus for all time and eternity. Amen. All things are possible to those who believe. This when he's saying you can do infinitely more than I can ask or imagine, and that's a true statement. But we tap into that power, unlimited greatness of his power by believing what he said in his word. Now that's right there is where a lot of Christians disconnect because number one, you have to believe what he said in his word. And number two, you have to know what he said in his word. And if you don't know what he said, then it's going to be impossible for, to, for you to believe it. But the, the, this coming to See, we have a responsibility, and, and so many in the church want to leave up to God what he's left up for us to do. And uh, he took care of his end. Glory to God. He's been faithful to us. He, 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 Jesus makes intercession for us, but we need to get it right. We need to do our part, and our part is spending time in his word, hearing from him, faith coming to us because we're hearing his word, and then stepping out and acting on it, trusting, trusting what he says. Amen. Uh, and then the last one is Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 9. Beginning in verse 9. Glory to God. Paul says, for this reason, I have not stopped praying about this. Or I ha this has been a priority. You know, are there certain things um, uh, when we think of the Lord or we go before the Lord that you notice in your own life that are always at the forefront of whether you're worshiping or, or, or needing something. or um, This is what Paul's saying here. He has not stopped praying or this is always the most important thing. And it's shocking to see what the most important thing is in Paul's life given his current situation. Um, one would think that uh, his priority is to get out of prison. And that is a priority. But it doesn't, it doesn't trump the priority of knowing who God is. 
and being filled with wisdom. And so we're going to see, he says, for this reason, I have not stopped seeking you about this. And it wasn't about anything that he needed. He said, I'm asking you, God, to fill me with an understanding and knowledge of your will. And his will is his word, an understanding of his word, or Jesus, because the will, the word, and Jesus are the same. Fill me with the not, and that's in the scripture as well. I didn't just make that up. Uh, John 1.1 1, 1 talks about that. Um, fill me with the understanding of your will through every kind of spiritual wisdom and insight. It amazes me that Paul saw that as being so much more important than being able to just get out of prison. I mean, getting out of prison was, was important too, but he understood that he was not moved by his present condition, that although he was chained, the gospel wasn't. In fact, he said that several times in the epistles. He said, fill me with an understanding of your will, your word. Do you hunger for an understanding of his word? Oh, I, I hunger for that. I, I, a, a working knowledge and understanding of his word and his will for my life, for this church, for our families. Through every kind of spiritual wisdom, spiritual wisdom and insight. He says, I ask this so that I will live the kind of life that proves that I belong to you. There's the, the, the only way the only way that the world is going to know that there is something different about us. Um, forget the outward because it's an inward work. And if, 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 if the heart of the tree is good, then the, the, the fruit on the tree will be good. Right? Um, the only way the world is going to see that we serve a good God and that we belong to him is by the fruit that we bear. But that starts inside. Healing for our bodies starts inside before it ever manifests to the outside. And, uh, and, and, and you know, you may have heard the term, uh, that's just like putting a Band-Aid on it. That, all that's doing is putting a Band-Aid on it. Um, and, there, and there's truth to that. The heart... Is, the, is, is what needs to be adjusted. And faith is of the heart. And your heart will begin to agree with God when you begin to study and honor God and put his word first. And then the outward, there's proof that I belong to him. You'll have a joy about you. You'll be well. You'll be supplied. Those things will be happening. You know, Proverbs, in Proverbs chapter 18 I don't know if it's 18 or 418 or 18, 4, I don't know. But, um, but it says the path of the just gets brighter and brighter, brighter and brighter into the full, full sun of the noonday. And, but the path of the wicked is dark, it's troublesome, um, and, uh, and, and they, don't, they, they don't know what they're stumbling over. But if you're the righteous and you're a just person, which we are if you're a believer, um, then your path gets brighter. Your path gets stronger, it gets brighter, and that's what we're talking about. This is why he says, fill me with every kind of spiritual wisdom and insight. I'm asking this so that I will live the kind of life that proves that I belong to you. Then I will want to please you in every way. As I grow in producing every kind of good work by this understanding and this knowledge that I've received about you. Does that make sense to everybody? I ask you to strengthen me by your glorious might with all the power that I need to patiently endure and overcome everything with a smile on my face, <laughs> with joy. And we talked about that yesterday. We're going to pick up a little bit uh, on that again today about patient endurance. And we're going to look at some diligence and add that to the mix um, because we've been talking about humility. And all these things go together. It, it really comes down to the, an, a submitted, submissive, and willing heart. That's what it comes down to. So uh, all the power that I need to patiently endure and overcome everything with joy. I also thank you, Father, for you have made me able to share the light 
And that's what we're doing today. That's what you are to do wherever you go, which is what you want for me to inherit. You, Father God, you rescued me. You delivered me. You set me free from the power of darkness. You redeemed me from the power of darkness. You know, redemption... If you've ever, we live here in, uh, in the shore community, and in the summertime, it's all arcades and boardwalk and beaches and the ocean and uh, rides and amusements. And uh, if you've ever been into an arcade, you put money in the machine and, and you play these games and the machines give you tickets, right? They give you tickets and then uh, you, you spend <laughs> tons of money for, for these tickets so that you can go and redeem them for a prize that's worth a fraction of the money that you put into the machines. Uh, but that's how they stay in business. But redemption is you're your your trading your tickets for some product. And, uh, and so when we've been rescued, the Bible says that we've been redeemed from the curse of the law. We've been redeemed from sickness, disease, destruction, spiritual death, poverty, from all those things. So how did it happen? How did that happen? Well, the redemption went like this. God sent Jesus in the form of the payment, in the form of the ticket. And I'm not trying to demean it in any way, but I'm trying to give us a visual. And, uh, and, and, and um, he took our junk and himself bore it in his body and the, he became the payment, the ticket. And in return, here presenting Jesus on the cross, right, risen from the dead, redemption has been paid, the price has been paid, and in return, God gave us all the glories of heaven. He gave us eternal life. He gave us health. He gave us prosperity. He gave us peace, joy, love, sound mind. This is what this means when you, Father God, have rescued me. You have redeemed me from the power of darkness. Now, when that happens, that's a done deal. They don't come back to you and say, oh, no, here's your ticket. Give us our product back. No, it's done. That is a forever settled fact that we have been redeemed from the powers of darkness. That means the power of darkness is forbidden to have any dominion or any rule or any say in the life of a believer. Now, uh, what we tolerate and allow is a different, different situation. But by rights, by rights, it has no right. It has no power. It has no ability. It is illegal trespassing. So this is where we come in as believers. And when the thief comes and tries to put this kind of nonsense in our life, we have to say, nope, I've been redeemed from the curse of the law. Father God has rescued me from the power of darkness. So I forbid you from operating any further in my life, through pain, through depression, through lack, through anything. I've been redeemed from it. I am no longer bound by any of that. Now, I've been brought into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of Jesus Christ, whom he loves. Glory to God. Friend, this is how the believer is supposed to live. Living this way, will make it easy for the world to see that we belong to him. And this is the way God wants us to live. You know, the condition of the sheep is a reflection of the shepherd. And we don't want to reflect the shepherd as being a, uh, a, a lazy shepherd because God knows he's not. He's done everything that pertains and given to us everything that pertains to life and godliness. But now it's our time to, to rise up in the strong spirit of faith and lay hold of the promises of God. Claim these things on our life. Speak it out of our mouths. Refrain from saying anything that's contradictory to that. And, uh, and, and when we do these things, 
His word never returns void, but it accomplishes what it's been sent forth to do. Amen. Father, thank you so much for your word today. These prayers have helped us immensely, tremendously, Father. We want to do it your way. I thank you, Lord, that your anointing is here now and it's working in the lives of all those who are hearing. For they have ears to hear and hearts to receive. I thank you for it, Lord. I thank you for it. Praise God. Well, let's get into this. We've been, uh, and I'm not going to go back and read it again for time's sake. But we were looking at the, uh, the, the subject of great faith and how Jesus marveled two times in the New Testament about a person's or two people's faith. And it was the Canaanite, the Syrophoenician woman who was not a Jew by, by, by heritage. Uh, and the, the centurion servant who was also not a part of the uh, inheritance and, and the heritage of the Jewish people. But yet those were the two that Jesus marveled and actually made a point of saying, I've never seen faith like this. Great is your faith. And, uh, and the, the key ingredient that we have seen through study and through looking at this and through the master himself and how he conducted himself was humility, great humility. And our faith being tried and tested and still remaining humble and true in agreeing with God and submitted and submissive to God. And, uh, and so we saw that even with the centurion servant who's a man of you don't become a centurion by being a lazy bum and irresponsible, uh, especially in the Roman army. So he was a man of means and power and he understood that. But he also knew that he was under authority as well. And he, he, he yielded to the power of the master, Jesus, and through an act of humility, and Jesus marveled at it, and his servant was made whole. The same situation occurred with the Syrophoenician woman. Um, she yielded to the power of who Jesus was. She humbled herself, even though she was told that none of these blessings belonged to her, and it's not for her, and why would he give what, what belongs to the the children, why would he give it to, to dogs? You know, uh, it, not that he was calling her a, referring to her as a dog, but uh, a dog is a companion, and in the grand scheme of things, human life uh, is, is trumps a dog's life. And uh, so that was the illustration that he was using, and he says, I'm not giving to you, uh, why would I give the children's bread to the dogs? And... Uh, and she said, yes, sir, you're right about that. But she said, but even, and here's submission, not arguing, but here's yielding. Even the dogs get to eat the crumbs from their master's table. And, uh, and he marveled at that. And he said, your fa- woman, your faith is great. You, 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 you have a heart of humility. And, uh, and in doing so, the woman's daughter uh, was delivered from demonic oppression and, uh, and possession. Uh, but the point of all that was... Humility, humility. So we, we got on that subject. Then yesterday, and of course, that doesn't mean we're done, close the book on it. We have just scratched the surface on humility. We should be praying every day, God, keep your finger on areas of my life that I need to humble myself in. And he'll show it to you. And he's gracious. He doesn't do it all at one time because we get overwhelmed with that. But little at a time, you'll start to notice things. And, uh, and an act of humility is saying, God, you're right. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Or saying to somebody else, you're right, I'm sorry, forgive me. That's humility. Uh, but then yesterday we began to speak on the subject of patience. And how patient, uh, uh, through faith and patience, we see that Abraham and uh, obtained the promises. Now we talked about patience yesterday. And we had some scriptures that we were looking at in Hebrews chapter 6. And then in Hebrews chapter 10. And uh, patience... Um, is the, uh, the ingredient that's needed to endure, to endure. And, and, uh, and we live in this instant, uh, instantaneous type society, a drive-through mentality where I can order something on Amazon and in two hours it could be at my front door. Uh, there's, it's good to have that, but it has created impatient people. And if we don't get it right away, we kind of lose heart or we pitch a, a fit over it. And um, the scriptures tell us through patient endurance, we obtain the promise. 
And uh, patience means long-suffering, forbearance, sticking to it even when you're tempted to give up. And, uh, and this is where this other word that we're going to look at a little bit today, the word diligence comes in. Diligence um, is painstaking effort. Now, if you've missed some of these so far, I would encourage you to go back, like I said, go to our YouTube channel, and you can listen to these again. Um, because if you've been believing God, now is not the time to stop believing him. It's through patient endurance that we obtain the promise. And uh, you're closer today than you were yesterday. So gird yourself up, gird up your mind, and, and begin to declare what God's word says in the face of what your situation's saying, if it's differently or contradictory. You say, no, I forbid that. I am nothing but healed because himself took mine. And if he took it, then that means I can't have it either. If he took it, we both don't have it. He has it. And, uh, and you begin to declare what God's word says. But through perseverance, through forbearance, through long-suffering, through sticking with it, you will obtain the manifestation. You already believe you receive it, but you will obtain the manifestation, the here and now, of what you believe God for. Does everybody agree with that? that is what God, that's the principle that God has used. And then we looked at, we looked at 2 Peter chapter 3. We left off with that in, uh, in verse 9, verse 8 and 9. And I used the, this example that God operates the same way. He's not telling us to do something that he doesn't live and do in practice. And uh, 2 Peter 3, 8 and 9 says, Dear friends, don't overlook this one fact. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years because I imagine the people were complaining about things. Right? And we've all been tempted to complain, and maybe we've yielded to it. Why is it taking so long? What's going on? And, uh, and Peter says, D don't overlook this one fact. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. So the things that we may have uh, released faith for is probably only five minutes ago, God's time. And that'll help us to realize, ah, well, I shouldn't be so impatient. It's only been five minutes to God. So um, if someone uh, got impatient with you, if they asked you something and you didn't respond or give it to them in five minutes, you'd, wouldn't you be like, dude, relax. It was, you just asked me five minutes ago. Give me at least an hour. And an hour, that's, that's, that's a long wait in God's time, right, for us. So uh, uh, the... the uh, Lord is, one, is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. Verse 9, this is how God operates. The Lord does not delay his promise or does not withhold his promise. He's not slack concerning his promises, as some understand the term delay. Well, what's holding it up? Well, there's a problem, and uh, they, they misplaced the formula. And that's not the issue. God has not misplaced the formula for his promises coming to pass as some understand it. But he is patient with us. There's the word patient. Do you know what that means? He suffers long on our behalf, like we should suffer long on the behalf of others, which is the ultimate sign of humility. It's the ultimate act of love. He, okay, is patient with us, and here's why. He's forbearing long for us, because he does not want any person to perish. It is his will that every human being receive repentance and make it to heaven. That is his goal. That's been his desire from the beginning. So his forbearance is waiting so that every person on the planet has an opportunity to hear and to repent. Glory to God. So for us to wait a little bit is not a big deal because it's like having money in the bank. It's, it's as good as done as far as I'm concerned. And in the meantime, we rejoice. We stir ourselves up. We live in the blessing. We walk in it. We speak to our circumstances. We don't allow our circumstances to dictate to us. And so, um, and so we, there was the recap on that. But diligence, I want to read just a couple scriptures in Proverbs about diligence. Now, I've taught on Sunday mornings uh, about being diligent, a diligent heart. And the term, the word diligent, means painstaking effort, which is a lot different than being casual about something and just 
giving it a try. Well, I've heard people say, well, I'll, I'll try, I'll try uh, believe in God. Well, don't waste your time. Um, it's painstaking effort. It is patient, long-bearing, forbearance, and long-suffering. And uh, that's called the fight of faith. Now we understand why God used the term fight, because it is a fight. Who are we fighting? Not flesh and blood. We're fighting the spirit that would try to deter us, our minds, from yielding to lies and temptations and deception. That's what we're fighting. But diligence is a matter of the heart. And a diligent heart always produces good. Always produces good. This is what God's word has to say about diligence. And again, diligence is painstaking effort. It is not the easy road. It's not the drive through It is the long haul. It is the I'm in it to win it, and I will stay with it till I have it. That's what diligence is. So uh, Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 24 says this, The hand of the diligent will rule. The hand of the person that puts in painstaking effort will rule. But the lazy man who wants to drive through will be put to forced labor. Okay? Follow along with me. I didn't make that up. That is the anointed word of God in Proverbs chapter 12. Then Proverbs chapter 13 in verse 4 says, The soul of a lazy person desires, always I want, I want, and has nothing, nothing, but the soul of the diligent, the one who puts in the painstaking effort, shall be, shall be made rich. So what does that tell me? That doesn't mean that the minute I say I'm diligent, that I'm rich, I shall be made well supplied. I shall have the provision that he has promised. Friend, it is coming. It is coming, and when it does, we won't even remember the painstaking effort as we rejoice in God's bountiful blessings in our life. But the, the soul of the diligent shall be made. Shall be made. That means in due time, which is also found in Galatians. In due season, at the right time, shall be made rich or shall be made well supplied. And we're not just talking about financial. We're talking about spirit, rich in your spirit, or well supplied in your spirit, well supplied in your health, spirit, soul, and body. That's his will. But only the diligent shall be made that way. The one who wants it instantaneously, they're going to they're gonna want and have nothing. Then the last one that I want to read is Proverbs 21 in verse 5. The plans, the plans. In other words, the purposes, the plans, the intent, the, 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 the thoughts of the diligent, the ones who put in painstaking effort, okay, not the ones who want to run through the drive through and get something real quick, and then go sit back on the couch and do nothing, the plans of the diligent lead surely to plenty. And there it is again, lead surely. Which, what does that tell us? That is in due time, in due season, uh, forbearing and being patient in the process. The plans of the diligent, okay? Your plans, your ideas, your thoughts concerning the things of God, the call that he has on our lives, lead surely to plenty. But those of everyone who are hasty and who are looking to get rich quick or the quick fix, surely lead to poverty. But those of everyone who is hasty surely lead to poverty or lead to lack or lead to always doing without or never having enough. Can you see this? This, But can you see how diligence ties into humility as well, which is the key ingredient to having great faith? The master himself said it. Being diligent takes submission. When, you're, when everything in your heart and your, in your mind is telling you this isn't working, I'm tired of doing this. We have to get to the scriptures and say, do not, I will not grow weary in well-doing. For in due season, I will reap if I faint not. That's painstaking effort, but that's also humility. 
That's submitting to God's word when your flesh is screaming out for a quick fix, something different. And, uh, and the enemy will be there to accommodate those feelings. But see, we live by faith. We walk by faith, not by our feelings, not by the five physical senses, not by sight or what we feel, but we walk by faith. And you know what? He's praying, like he said to the disciples and to Peter, he's praying that our faith not fail. And, uh, and our faith will not fail because it's his faith. And if we'll stay with it and keep c claiming the promise and acting like we already have it and always agreeing with God, it won't be long. And we will be walking in the full manifestation of that promise. Amen. I hope this has been an encouragement to you today. Submit your heart to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. Keep the switch of faith turned on for uh, your best days are yet to come. God bless you. We love you. Thank you for being part today. Uh, remember, we have our women's meeting tonight. Abundant Grace Church women's meeting every Thursday at 6 p.m. So if you're in the area, Tom's River, New Jersey, come on out and visit with us.